We're going to be reading from the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. Exodus meaning, of course, exit, <laughs> departure. And we're going to read in Exodus chapter 14. And for, the, for right now, we're going to read verses 10 through 14. Exodus chapter 14. Verses 10 through 14. Hallelujah. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, then they said to Moses, their pastor. Sometimes pastors get dumped on. I think I should know that after 37 years. They said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Let me just pause and say in parentheses, they came out of Egypt, but Egypt never came out of them. Now that's another sermon for another day. That's another lesson for another month. But think, chew on that a little bit. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone? That's crazy. Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. My God, how we can be at times with the Lord and even with leadership. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Verse 13, stand still. See, I was talking about trust a little while ago. That's basically what it's saying. Stand still. Don't move. Trust. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. I'm glad he didn't say that you are going in conjunction with the Lord accomplish. No, he said he's going to accomplish it. Just stand still and watch it happen. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. How many of you know that big brother Jesus fights for us? That there are moments in our lives when the bully, the devil, wants to push us around. And when we say, big brother, it's all yours. Fact of the matter and the truth of the matter is, he's already been defeated. How old is this victory? Over 2,000 years. Yet the devil doesn't want you to know that. The Lord will fight for you. And you shall hold your peace I've chosen to entitle this message if you would put the title up the devil in the rearview mirror the devil in the rear view mirror what did, what what do some of them rearview mirror say objects may appear closer than what they really are <laughs> Yeah. We're going we're, we're gonna to look at a story today, and we're going to do the application here in this message. Let me give you a little background, uh, a historical background leading up to, this, to these verses. Israel had been in bondage. They had been slaves for more than 400 years in Egypt. They developed a slave mentality, and it showed during their sojourning through the wilderness. And we read it 
part of it here. They wanted to go back to Egypt. We had it better back there. Isn't that crazy? When the devil shows up and says, you know what? Uh, man, you had more friends before you got baptized. You had more fun when, before you got baptized. Now you're there in that church. You don't know half the people. All you do is clap and sing and hear a sermon and then leave. Whereas, before, listen, the devil says, this is Memorial Weekend. Remember? Who said that? Yes, sir, my brother. I'm getting there. <laughs> but thank you for helping me out. This is Memorial Weekend. Remember how we used to party and every, invite everybody and carne asada? And, and then after the carne asada, we used to get drunk and high and all kinds of things and dance without partners because we were so drunk. Man, don't you miss that? You got to understand that with all of that, we would wake up not only hungover, but we would wake up empty, unfulfilled, lacking joy, lacking peace, lacking fulfillment. But now in Jesus Christ, oh, it's so different, isn't it? We don't need alcohol. We don't need drugs. We don't need a party lifestyle. We can party in the Holy Ghost. We can party, hallelujah, in Jesus Christ. So for 400 plus years, they were slaves in Egypt. But God had a plan. Wasn't the pastor preaching last week about God having a plan? God had a plan. He allowed 400 plus years to transpire. You see, because to God, time doesn't really exist. To us, it does. It's, it's May the 28th. Tomorrow's May the 29th. I know. And God says, you know what? I live in eternity, past, present, future. I don't measure time the way you folks do. So after those 400 years, he raises up Moses, a stammerer, a stutterer. Not a Bible college student, with all due respect. Not somebody with an AA or BA or whatever. But he raises up a, a, a man, a simple man. But he empowered that man. Let me tell you right now, you may not have it all together. You may only have a grammar school education or a high school diploma, or maybe you don't have any kind of diploma. But if you have Jesus, he's more than enough. He's more than sufficient to provide your needs and to use you in his kingdom. If I could talk to you about my background in school, it was embarrassing. But God. So God uses Moses. And in the course of that, that era, 10 plagues were brought down upon the Egyptians. But God, in his sovereign plan, would purposely harden Pharaoh's heart. Listen, don't try to figure out God because you, you, you're not going to be able to do it. Just trust him. He would harden Pharaoh's heart. He would soften it, harden it, soften it, harden it. The last plague, the tenth plague, was the death of the firstborn. And even Pharaoh's son died. And he said, that's it, that's it. Get out of here. Yo, go serve your God in the wilderness. Go do your thing out there. And so approximately two to three million Israelites packed everything they owned and left Egypt after 400 plus years. Now, let, let me tell you something about serving God. It was a glorious day, the day you and I got baptized in Jesus' name. Whew. March the 24th, for me, 1973. 
Wow, I wasn't even born yet. I know. I know I'm old. That's my, that was my spiritual birthday. I'm not going to tell you about my physical birthday. And it was a glorious, joyous occasion. Do you remember that? When you give your life to Jesus? And after that, you thought, oh, God, I can conquer the world. Nothing can bother me. Not even the devil. But then things began to happen. Satan began to show up to try to show off and let you know, hey, I'm going to pull you back. See, all of a sudden, somebody told Pharaoh, hey, Pharaoh, the people that were in bondage that you let go, what are you going to do now? And God hardened his heart because he had a plan. And he got his chariots together, his horsemen, and they pursued the Israelites to bring them back. Now, the Israelites got to the border, to the coast of the Red Sea. I remember in 1993, the trip that we took to the Holy Land, we went to, we saw the Red Sea. It was something to behold. They get there, and all of a sudden, they see dust billowing behind them. And then they hear the hooves of the horses and the chariots, their wheels. And they understood Pharaoh is pursuing us. So that leads me to the first point, if you could put it up there. Pharaoh behind them. He decided to pursue them to bring them back. As soon as you and I give our lives to the Lord, guess who shows up? The devil himself. Where do you think you're going? Well, I'm going to serve the Lord. Yeah. Over my dead body, you're going to serve the Lord. I've told Satan, well, if that's what it means, if that's what it takes. He pursued them. That's why I entitled this message, The Devil in the Rear View Mirror. Yeah. My God. They began to understand, listen, Pharaoh is going to catch up with us and we're through. You're talking about mothers with children. You're talking about elderly, barely walking. You're talking about people with, with cattle, with camels, with, with uh, uh, livestock. They're moving at a snail's pace. They're moving slowly. The devil says, uh, I'm going to get you. I remember the day after I got baptized, the day after I got baptized, my so-called friends showed up with beer and marijuana. Frank, let's go, man. Hey, what'd you do to your hair? I had, I, when I got baptized, I had hair to my shoulders. It was the hippie era, okay? <laughs> Settle down. He said, hey, Frank, you going to the army? I said, well, so to speak. <laughs> Let's go, man. We got the beer. We got the marijuana. We got everything. Let's go. He goes, guys, I'm not going to do that no more. W -w -w Wait a minute. You're the biggest party animal among us. Let's go. No. You, I'm not going to follow you, but you can follow me. Where? To church. Oh. Because this guy is no longer going to do those things. I've been delivered. I've been set free from that lifestyle. You're not going to see me in those nightclubs no more. You're not going to see me partying anymore. You're not going to see me doing drugs and selling drugs. Because Jesus set me free. So here's Israel. They're clean. They're clean because the blood of the lamb that was smeared on their doorpost represents that they were all washed with the blood of the lamb. And they're starting a brand new life, but the devil doesn't care. 
You'll see in your spiritual rearview mirror Satan approaching you at different times, tempting you, call, telling you you're not going to make it. You can't be a Christian. Give it up. You're not strong enough to serve God. I know your weaknesses. I know your penchant for evil. Let me, I feel like telling somebody, don't give in to that. Don't let the devil harass and intimidate you that way. Tell him, Satan, you are a liar. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And keep marching. Keep marching. Because the devil's not going to give up. He's going to pursue you like he pursued many of us. And still to this day, he will try things. He will try to get to us. I don't care how long you've been serving the Lord. Satan doesn't give up. He's won a lot of battles, by the way. But the biggest battle of all, Jesus won it for us. And you don't have to be a wimp. You can be a warrior. You don't have to live defeated. You can be a conqueror. Every single day of your life. You can stand up to your unsaved relatives and say, you know what? No beer in this house. No wine in this house. Yeah, and put away those, those cigarettes. I saw them. Throw them out or I'll throw them out. Praise God. But many times I've seen Christians say, well, you know, I don't mess with them. I don't say they're not saved. So, oh, so they can smoke in your house. They can drink and fuss and cuss in your house just because they're your relatives. Oh, I went somewhere. I opened a door. Yeah, I might as well go through it. <laughs> I heard a preacher say a long time ago, we must take a stand for something lest we fall for anything. <laughs> Chew on that one for a while. There's times, saint, that we must take a stand. In this house, we don't allow cussing. We don't allow alcohol. We don't allow drugs. We don't allow dirty mouths. This is a Christian home. These are our apostolics. We are blood washed. We are spirit filled. Our names are written in the book of life. We don't allow those things in this house. I remember somebody allowing their daughter's boyfriend to live with her and sleep with her in the bedroom because he was a soul. He needed Jesus. I told this person, he needs more than Jesus. He needs a whipping. And I can go over there and whip him in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you got to take a stand. These precious children... They're going to heaven. Satan can't have them. The devil cannot destroy their lives. The devil cannot destroy your virginity. The devil can't destroy you with drugs, with alcohol, with gangs, and all of that. You must take a stand, mom and dad, and son and daughter. Take a stand for Jesus. Because if you do that, he'll take a stand for you. Pharaoh behind them. Give me the second one. The Red Sea before them. The obvious obstacle. You think that living for God is just the devil's going to say, be my guest. Go for it. You know, hey, oof, I'm done with you. Go ahead. No, there's obstacles. The Red Sea 
was at that point in time the major obstacle to them. Why is it, Bishop, that we have to have those kind of obstacles? So that you can learn how to live for God. If it's always going to be the easy way out, we're not going to develop. We're going to lack maturity. Trials, tribulations, testings are part and parcel of living for God. No sooner had they come out from Egypt that there's the Red Sea in front of them. Hmm. You know, I thought this was going to be easy. I thought living for God was just going to be all Holy Ghost and not running aisles and jumping and twirling. I saw a brother one time who twirl. I said, all right, I'd like to try that, but I'm too heavy. So I'm just going to observe. <laughs> it's more than that. It's shedding tears. It's losing some battles at home, at the job, among so-called friends. It's being attacked in your body, your mind, your emotions, your will. You know you want that. Yeah, but you know I'm, I can't have it because I'm an apostolic. But you know you want it. No one's around. Go for it. <laughs> Go for that website. Go for that pornographic website. Oops. Not here, Bishop. Hmm. You'd be surprised. Some toes just got stepped on. I'm sorry, brother. I can pray for your toes. But I'd much rather pray for your soul. You know what? That obstacle is too big for me. That challenge is too big. I think I'm going to go back. Go back to what? Go back to your friends and say, I knew you couldn't make it. That day that my friend showed up with beer and marijuana and all of that, we give you three months, they said. We give you three months, Frank, and you'll be back with us. I said, you are a liar, Satan. That was 50 years ago. And the Lord has kept me saved. And the Lord can keep you saved. You don't have to give in and succumb to those voices and to those temptations and to those things that are hurled against you. You can take a stand and say, you know what? I don't care how much it costs me. I don't care the price I have to pay. I'm going forward. I preached a message here one day. I think it was in Spanish on God's Transmission, the transmission, and I applied it. You know, some people like reverse. They want to go back. Some people are in neutral, right? Well, you know what? I don't like to make an issue out of anything. I don't even, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, undercover. I'm an undercover apostolic. That's a new one. No one knows and no one needs to know. I'm undercover. Okay. And then someone, some folks are in park. They just, they don't, you can't move them. They don't move. They don't go forward. They don't go backwards. They're just stuck in park. You know what? I don't want to be in park. I don't want to be in neutral. I don't want to be in reverse. I want to be in first, second, and full. And I want to be in four-wheel drive, man. The Red Sea before them. What an obstacle. If you jump a few books later, because Moses died, and he wasn't able to take the people into the promised land. But Joshua did. But he encountered another obstacle, Pastor Anthony. It wasn't the Red Sea. 
It was the Jordan River. And if you read chapter 3 of the book of Joshua, you will discover what I have discovered. The Bible says that God called them to cross the Jordan when jo the Jordan was at its flood level. Wait a minute. First of all, the Red Sea. And now the Jordan when it's overflowing? Come on, God. When are you going to make it easier for me? Let me let you in on a big secret. It's never easy. And we're heading into the most perilous times that the church has ever experienced. Don't you understand that we're living in the last days and the devil is throwing everything, even the kitchen sink at us? But is it time to backslide? Is it time to leave the church? Is it time to leave the things of God? No. You've got to roll up your sleeves. You've got to get on your knees. You've got to take a stand and say, you know what? I don't care what the devil throws at me. I don't care what the world throws at me. I am going to serve the Lord. And I'm going to say like Joshua, me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Do I have any witnesses here in the house? It doesn't matter what obstacles the devil throws. I'm more than a conqueror. The Lord's going to see me through. Single mother, I know you have it hard. It's not easy for you. The economy and everything else that goes with it. But the Lord is with you. Married couple, you've had your struggles. The Lord is with you. Young person, the Lord is with you. Hallelujah. Children, the Lord is with you. Richard Chavarria, the Lord is with you. Remember we were talking before service? You have some challenges in your life. But I, I want to tell you, Richard, right now, we've known you for a long time here. Amen. And you haven't left. You're still here. The Lord is with you, Richard. You already have the victory. You don't have to look for the victory, Richard. You already have it. So the people are complaining. What are we going to do? You brought us out here to die? And that leads, brings me to the third point. Fear inside of them. One of Satan's favorite tools... One of his favorite weapons is fear. Did you know that? The devil can use fear to cause things to appear when they're invisible, really. You're worrying for really absolutely nothing. I'm going to get you. I'm going to kill you. When you least expect it, I'm going to sneak up behind you. And you're like, Oof. you go to bed and you're like, Oof. To sleep, man. Snore in the devil's face. <laughs> Drool in the name of Jesus. <laughs> right, honey? Uh, we got this. But fear. You know, there was a young pastor in the, in the New Testament named Timothy. Timothy was pastoring in Ephesus. Did you know that Ephesus at that time was the largest church in that empire? But then it, a persecution started by the Roman government. And people began to leave. People went AWOL on the church. They began to leave. And Timothy got discouraged. Paul is in prison for the gospel. And he writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us three things, power, love, and a sound mind. Stir up the gift of God that is in you, Timothy. And I believe those words reverberate to our times. Brother and sister, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Stir up the gift of God that is in you. Moses had to tell the people to stand still. 
and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, I, I want you to give me one verse uh, or a couple of verses here from the same chapter. I'll let you know here. Give me a verse, verse 15. Start with verse 15. Watch this of Exodus 14. Verse, fif verse 15 of Exodus 14. All right. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? You see, our God is always positive. There's not a negative bone in his body. There's not a negative tone in his voice. God will never say, well, you know what? We'll have to figure this thing out. Let me consult the angels on this, and I'll get back with you. No, God doesn't reason that way. He always has it together. He's very positive. Even in the most Major predicaments. Watch verse 15. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. There's no going backward now, brother and sister. We're too far into this thing. We need to go forward. Turn to the person next to you and tell her, go forward. Now, give me verse 14. No, verse 16, please. God is speaking to Moses. But lift up your rod. What do you have in your hand, Moses? A rod. Stretch it out. You, don't, you and I don't understand how much power we have. How much victory is in our lives. God says, use it. Take advantage of it. He says, lift up your rod and stretch it out. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. <laughs> now that's authority and power. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. But watch verse 17 because God's in control again. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Verse 18, then the Egyptians shall know <laughs> that I am the Lord. Let's substitute in there, parentheses. Then your unsaved relatives shall know. That I am the Lord. Then your neighbors shall know. That I am the Lord. Then your co-workers shall know. That I am the Lord. And so all the worldly people. Shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained honor for myself. Myself over Pharaoh. His chariots and his horsemen. Praise God. Brother and sister, don't fear. I have some decisions to make, Bishop, this week. I don't know how it's going to go. Don't fear. Yeah, but the, I, I, I must appear before very important people. Don't fear. I might lose my job. I don't know. Don't fear. One door closes, God opens another one. And while that door opens, praise him in the hallway. Quit complaining. Quit murmuring. I knew it. I knew God hears other people, but he doesn't hear me. Cry out to him and find out. If you're his child, if you're his blood-washed child, spirit-filled child, cry out to him. Jeremiah said, cry out. I cried to the Lord and he heard me. 
and he delivered me from all my troubles. Fear inside. You don't think preachers have fear? Well, it doesn't look like it. You look like you have it pretty much together. <laughs> yeah, but we, we get afraid. Fear attacks all of us. Fear can attack a pastor. I wonder how that newly baptized individual is doing. I don't see him here. I don't see them here. I just married them and I baptized them. Where are they? How is that young people? Why does that young people look so, so lost? Everybody's worshiping. Everybody's praising. And I don't see those hands raised by that young lady or that young man. What's going on? That, that worries pastors and youth leaders. And then fear is right behind that. They're not going to make it. Cow, you're going to look bad in front of all of these families. No, you just keep plowing, keep going forward. You just keep doing what you're doing, Pastor Anthony, Sister Aiko. You just keep being who you are. Hallelujah. I've never have told Pastor Anthony, you have to do it just like me. You have to be a duplicate. I got news for you. There are no duplicates. We're all originals in the body of Christ. Don't try to be mimicking anybody else's style. Be yourself. Don't copy anybody else. I knew, I knew this young man. I know this young man. He's a pastor now, but he wasn't at the time. He stood just like his pastor behind the pulpit. And he would cough just like his pastor. I'm going, where did that come from? He would talk just like his pastor. Body, body movements. And I had to pull him to one side. I said, come here, bro. Come here, man. What's wrong with you? Because what do you mean? You're trying to be just like your pastor. I get it. But bodily movements and all of that. Hey, put that to one side. Imitate his faith. Don't imitate a style. You have to develop your own style. I have been on, pul on pulpits in conventions. I have been in activities where you have doctor of divinity guys sitting up there. And I'm like, sheesh, okay. Here's a semi-high school grad <laughs> standing with these guys. I don't have a chance. God says, you're not here to compete. You just preach. And then all of a sudden it gets prophetic and God says, go give that doctor over there a word. And I go, are you sure, Lord? Is that you or the devil? <laughs> I'm being sincere. And God has to tell me like three or four times, it's me. <laughs> go and give him a word. Okay, Lord. I remember going up to TF Tenney. The late T.F. Tenney, a general in the United Pentecostal Church. We were preaching on the same service and platform. I'm like, you really, Lord? And I go up to T.F. Tenney. I don't remember what God said through me to him. But he hugs me with tears coming down his cheeks. He says, with that Louisiana drawl that he had, you could have never known that about me. I messed it up. You could have never known that about me, young man. But the Lord hit it right on the money. Quit comparing yourself. Quit belittling yourself. Quit saying, what well, you know, no, I'm from the other side of the track. So am I. I'm a barrio guy. And sometimes you can take a guy out of the barrio, but you can't take completely the barrio out of him. I remember some barrio guy told me, orale. I said, orale al señor. <laughs> there you go. But I have seen things. I have experienced things for the honor and the glory of God that the average Christian has never seen and never experienced. But you got to get fear out of you. 
got to get rid of that fear, brother and sister. And say, Lord, here I am. Take me. Take my life and use it. Your relatives make. You know that Jesus was criticized by his relatives? He was. The Lord says, the prophet doesn't have any honor in his own country. And the Bible says that he could do very little miracles in Nazareth where he grew up. Imagine that. That's Jesus talking. How about you? You probably heard, hey, who, you sing, you, you, you do things. I used to change your diapers. I, I used to feed you. I used to babysit you. Now you're, you're Miss Holy? You're Miss Christian? Don't listen to those voices. Do your thing. Go beyond that. You're greater than that. Somebody say, praise the Lord. I need some witnesses here. You're better than your IQ, your intelligence quotient. You need another quotient, and that's your attitude quotient. Your AQ. You need to work on that one. Because if you can overcome that one, you can handle anything. You can appear before the most intelligent people in the world, and you already have a head start on them. Praise God. I remember a gentleman sitting here on a Thursday night, Anglo. And I don't go, I've never seen that guy here. So I kept on teaching then after the service, he goes, can I talk to you, Pastor? I go, sure. He goes, wow, I really enjoyed the way you spoke and the way you carried yourself. Can I make a, a proposition to you? I said, okay. We could, we could handle, we, we could use a guy like you on our board here in the city to, to assist the mayor and all these pieces. We'll, we'll stop right there. I want you to understand something, sir. I'm not a politician. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm not in interested in running for office. So God bless you. Thank you for coming to church. Come again. But you can tell your folks, I'm not interested. You have to understand who you are. What kind of calling you have. What kind of gifts you have. What God played, because God did not make a mistake when he made you. You know, parents can say, you know, you weren't supposed to be born. You were an accident. In God's eyes, there's no such thing. There now are no accidents here this morning. We are predetermined, predestined, and chosen from our mother's womb to be here. Man, I don't know why I'm going in that direction, but I feel it in the Holy Ghost. To give you courage. To, to give you determination. Young lady, what is your name? Brianna? You have had some rough going in your life, have you? From a, from a very young age, right? You've been put down. You've been shunned. You have had to get away from those people that they call themselves your family. Society has told you you're no good. But I felt something right now in the spirit to tell you God doesn't make mistakes. Come here. Give me your hand. Come here. Sister Eiko, come here. Come and help me. You are precious in the sight of God. And you are precious in the sight of God's people. You are somebody. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. You have a calling. Lift up your hands. And the pastor's wife's going to pray for you. Pray for her. Somebody pray for her. The devil's been messing with her for too long. The devil is a liar. Fear has been ripping 
her to shreds. But Jesus right now is working on her. Uh, My God, my God. My family, Bishop, has been telling me for years that I don't measure up to the rest of the family. That's too bad. Quit listening to them. And attune your ear to the voice of the Lord. The Lord, I've learned something in these 50 years of serving him. The Lord will never put you down. Yeah, but you don't know the, I've fallen. Yeah, but you've gotten yourself up. Can you imagine yourself, give me your imagination for a few seconds. Imagine your kids acting up. Kids do that, right? Imagine you say, starting tomorrow, you're going to go and live with the neighbors. What? Your dad and I are tired of you. We can't handle you no more. Starting tomorrow, I've already made prearrangements. You're going to have your own room, but you're going to have a different daddy and a different mama. That's ludicrous. That's crazy. You wouldn't do that to your children. Now, magnify that a million times over. Would God do that to us? No matter how many mistakes we've made, how many times we've fallen, tripped and fallen. No. Our God is a merciful God. Our God is a heavenly Father. Our God loves us! Give me the last point and I'm God's hand upon them. Here's homework. Read all of Exodus 14 and Exodus 15. Because in Exodus 15, uh, uh, Moses' sister Miriam pulled out her tambourine and the ladies started dancing and playing. And they sang a song. Oh, that song is so beautiful. I don't have time to get into it. Read it at home. Exodus 15. But God delivered them. You know, God waited for the last Israelite. This is how good God is. He won't let you die in the middle of your problem. God waited. When I learned this, man, I was running aisles in my own house. <laughs> God waited for the last Israelite to cross into dry land. Maybe it was a 90-year-old man, but God says, I'm waiting. Just like the last animal that went into Noah's ark, I think, I believe was a turtle or a snail. And maybe Noah was saying, come on. We've got to get this show on the road. I'm already starting to feel raindrops. God is so patient, he'll wait. The last Israelite crossed. And he purposely waited for, uh, for Pharaoh and his chariots to hit the middle of the Red Sea. And he says, now Moses, remember that rod? Yeah, now. You parted the Red Sea with it, right? Now, stretch it out again. And the waters came together. You know what else I find marvelous about that, that narrative? The Bible says that the wheels of the chariots came off. <laughs> Anything that the devil has against you and tries to do, it will come off. It's not going to work. So, Satan, I got a message for you if you're listening. Your stuff doesn't work on blood-washed, spirit-filled people. And as soon as they hit the middle, the waters came back together and drowned Pharaoh and all his army. God's hand upon them. 
I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what you've been going through this week or this whole month for that matter. But what I do know is that God wants to place his hand upon you. He wants to whisper in your ear, I'm with you. I've never left you. I have never forsaken you. Primo. It's good to see you. But you and your family have been going through your stuff. Right? I observed you today. And you know what I saw? I saw a lack of strength. I saw a little bit of discouragement. But I've come to tell you. You're the people of God. You're washed in his blood. You're filled with his spirit. Put discouragement to one side. And stand up and say devil you are a liar. We're going to serve Jesus for the rest of our lives. The devil in the rear view mirror. Ah.